So I had actually met Shannon Gans a few years before I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, Shannon's one of the founding members of New Deal Studios, along with Ian Hunter and Matthew Gratzner and producer David Sanger. And, you know, we were bidding the same projects against each other. Um, we were talking to the same visual effects supervisors and producers, and so it kind of seemed like a natural thing that we ended up becoming friends. We ended up doing a, a few projects together. We did Interstellar, we did some work on Wolf of Wall Street, we did uh, the Fast and Furious ride for Universal. When I came on, they were pretty far along with Interstellar, but uh, there were still some, some shots to be done and some work to be done. So Creation Consultants Limited is actually a rebranded version of my Canadian company, Miniature Effects Limited, that operated in Canada for about 22 years before I moved to LA. It's the same company that it was in Canada. We're still doing visual effects miniatures, we're doing specialty props, we're doing costume elements, and we're doing work for you know episodic television, feature film, uh, commercial advertising. We do some museum work from time to time. So still sort of taking on the same kinds of projects. Miniature effects and creation consultants the reason I, I founded these companies was because I love doing visual effects miniatures and doing the kind of work that we do. There might be people who would say, well, why would you start a new miniature effects company in Los Angeles at a time when so much was going digital? But there's always been work for miniature effects. It's always been something that has been an integral part of the visual effects toolbox for, for producers and visual effects supervisors. Certainly there's less of that kind of work happening compared to you know, 35 years ago when I started doing this kind of work, but it's still something that I'm very passionate about and something that I love to do. And so I you know, couldn't, couldn't not have uh, a company that did visual effects miniatures. It's just, it's what I do. So being asked to, to be a part of a Star Wars project would be a bucket list for, I think, a lot of people in this industry, particularly people like me who, who grew up loving Star Wars and, you know, kit bashing models in their, in their bedroom when they were young and recreating scenes from Star Wars and dioramas and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I couldn't have been more thrilled to, to work on that project. But the interesting thing was when I was asked to work on it, there was no indication that it was a Star Wars project in that, in that, in those first conversations. They just said, Hey, we've got this television project coming up and we think there's an opportunity to do miniatures in it. And we'd love to talk to you about uh, working on the project with us. And I said, of course, you know, I'd love to have a meeting with you. So I went down to the Marina to, uh, to have a meeting with them at their offices. And I'm sitting in the, in the room waiting for them to, you know, sort of start the meeting. And I'm looking around, I'm like, well, that, that's Luke Skywalker on the wall over there. And that's a speeder bike drawing over there. And that's a lightsaber on the table. And very quickly, you know, realized this is a Star Wars project. And, you know, you're trying not to get too excited and not be a fanboy about the thing. But it's obviously, it's a bucket list thing. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing to have the opportunity to work on something in the Star Wars universe. And my team and I were really, really thrilled to be asked to do the work that we did for them. Uh, what we end up creating were elements that were used as basically set extensions. So the miniatures that we created were, were going to be scanned and go through photogrammetry and be applied to simplified uh, digital architecture and then played on the LED screen behind live performances. Now that kind of switches up the way you normally do visual effects because we're a post-production world normally. You know, you get your live action plates and you go, okay, here's where your visual effects is going to slot in. And in this case, it was, here's what we intend to shoot live action. We need the visual effects first to drop in behind it. So you're, you're kind of turning that whole um, delivery cycle on its head and uh, approaching the job a little bit differently. So we ended up making um, miniature elements for episodes two, four, and seven of The Mandalorian season one. For episode two, we created some canyon elements for when the Mandalorian gets ambushed. And this was sort of a, uh, a canyon that was carved through sandstony, muddy kind of earth. And they had gone out and they had tried photographing different real world locations and doing some scanning, but they weren't happy with the results they were getting. So creating miniatures to use for the canyon just gave them a lot more freedom to, to place the elements as they wanted. Um, the other thing we made was the common house that you see in episodes four and seven. It's sort of like a, 
somewhat primitive wooden bar. So the direction was that it needed to look like have flavor of sort of a, a North American uh, native common house. So uh, a wood structure with lots of, you know, wood poles and lashing and that kind of thing. So using the drawings the art department gave us as a guide, we created patterns and forms that we could then steam and bend willow uh, branches around to give us the sort of the curvy profile of the building. And then steaming, you know, hundreds of pieces of wood to bend various profiles and then lashing them together using, you know, shipbuilding knots and, and waxed line and that kind of thing. It was, a, it was a fun build. And the interesting thing too was because it wasn't going to be uh, put on a stage and photographed in a more traditional way because it was going into scanning, we actually only needed to build one third of the miniature. So it's a round building. So we built basically a wedge of it, a one third wedge of it. And then, you know, they would, basically clone whatever elements they needed from that section that we built. But it was a great miniature. It was a good size. It was probably about six feet across and five feet tall and and just tons and tons of, of handwork in that. It's a miniature that was very traditional sort of in the way of building miniatures. Like there were no digital assets involved in making this thing. Everything was done by hand. All the, the wood elements were steamed and bent by hand and lashed together and all the painting and carving of the different, you know, wood details were all done by hand. Uh, and we constructed the miniature in layers. So it would, it would make it easier for photogrammetry and 3D scanning. You don't want to have the model as one big assembled thing because then parts start occluding each other when you're scanning. So when you look at the shots, even when you look at on set shots where uh, you know, if you didn't tell somebody, you know, and by the way, you're looking at an LED screen and you're not looking at a full size set, it would be very hard to tell. Uh, it looked great on screen and it was, it's a really interesting way to do miniatures. Um, it wasn't the first time we'd been involved with photogrammetry and 3D scanning, but it was obviously the first time our miniatures had been used as a full size set projected on an LED screen like that. Uh, and that really was sort of a door opening moment as well.